It's a pleasure to welcome you to Web Tools to Support Inquiry-Based Learning. I'm Karen Bonanno and your host and presenter for this broadcast. Uh, I've been involved in education for over 30 years and during this time I've made every effort to stay up to date with technology and the tools uh, that we can use effectively within the school community. In April of this year, in 2012, I, along with 16 other international recipients, was named as a Learning Commons visionary by the editors of the Journal for School Library Professionals, and this is a North American publication. So before we get underway with the content for this webinar, I just need to cover some basic housekeeping with you. The first one is that uh, the views that I will share with you tonight and also the information will be from my perspective and it will be important for you to take this information and then do your own further research and in particular to identify how the information would apply to your school community or to your organisation. In addition, our edu webinar does not give permission for any capture recording or reproduction of this webinar in any format. Also too, for this PowerPoint presentation that you're seeing at the moment, it will be available and the web link will be displayed on the screen at the end of this webinar. So let's get underway because this is a very, very interesting topic in particular um, for those of us who are going to be involved in the Australian curriculum and the integration and implementation of that particular curriculum program here within Australia. So very, in the first very instance, we have to kind of say, well, what do we mean by inquiry-based learning? And in particular, the main key is that inquiry-based learning is really about asking questions. And it's learning that's based on presenting our students with um, a scenario or with a problem and then through being a facilitator, we help them then to identify what are the crucial aspects that they need to investigate and explore and then to look at the questions that they will develop to then be able to gather the information that they need to then come up with either developing knowledge on a particular situation or coming up with some solutions. Often we see terms like problem-based learning or challenge-based learning these include the inquiry-based learning processes as part of that as well. So if you're looking at problem-based, it's a problem scenario that a student has been given to then go and find out their particular solutions to that issue. But what it does, it engages students in interacting with uh, an information-rich environment to then be able to come up with their particular um, answers that they have. Some things to uh, put us into perspective here because we need to be looking at the fact that there is going to be some global trends that will influence how we progress through in bringing together the particular web-based tools that will support the delivery of the curriculum and in particular support that pedagogical practice. If uh, most of us I think would have been familiar with uh, the K-12 Horizon report uh, which comes out every year and one of the reports is focused specifically on the K-12 to education process. And in these there are trends and influences which reflect the emerging technology that is um, taking place and having an influence and also in the thought about when this rolls out and has an impact on education. The very first one that I've got there is that there is a shift happening and it is moving to education being more online, more hybrid learning environments and more collaborative spaces being made available. So if we start to think about this, we can basically see the opportunity for how we can use web tools to be able to develop some of those online learning environments. It also starts to partner up with the concept of the flipped classroom or for those who are working in school libraries, the flip library concept. And what this means that we are able to develop content and processes and information 
that is available to the students that they can access outside of school so that when they come into a classroom or into the library or into a learning space, it's a richer experience because there can be conversations happening and that is all part of an inquiry process as well, is having those conversations around the questions within collaborative environments. The next one is that we are pretty conscious that with the generation of students that we have now, that the internet is a place of entertainment for them, it's a place for socialising, um, it's a place to find information, uh, it's a place also to develop relationships. And so we need to be conscious of this environment that we have students in and looking at the fact that it's very much uh, a participatory culture that we have our students engaging in that they're engaged in outside of school and we have to look at how we can bring that in so that we're engaging them within the learning process within the school environment. Another influencer is the bring your own technology and the bring your own device. And many of the web tools that we that I will be sharing with you can be accessed on mobile devices, but also on desktops, but also uh, it can be accessed on uh, laptops as well. And when we're looking at the drying up of funding for schools to be recipients of technology and hardware, and it starts to fall into the category of the school looking at how it budgets for itself, one of the crucial elements that comes out of the research is that the school will need a very robust and strong Wi-Fi connection. And that's going to be crucial when you're going to have students and multiple numbers of, of connections to particular web tools that you would be embedding um, into the teaching and learning practices and processes. This particular threesome, the Collaborate, Communicate, Create, um, has actually been around for a long period of time, but it, it is becoming more and more prevalent that we are seeing students engaging more in collaborative models, processes, and they are more attuned to being together and working in teams. In fact, they thrive in that multimedia environment and they thrive in being able to uh, connect in with others and being able to work together. So they value that uh, learning environment where they can use their technology, they can connect in with others, they can share in that whole learning process. So that's uh, another trend that we see is emerging and is basically predicted to be, all of these are basically predicted to be happening over the next sort of one to three years. And then of course we bring in the challenge base, active learning, which is where we are tonight in, in talking about what inquiry-based learning is and how it can be supported by web tools in the process. This next slide I've, I've put in here because I, I really want to reiterate the fact that the internet is an environment where young people are engaging in the connection with others, developing their relationships and this particular aspect came out of uh, infographic and we would be kidding ourselves and fooling ourselves to not be aware that we have got 10 year olds who have Facebook accounts. We've got you know, people who are younger than the prescribed 13 years of age who've got Facebook accounts. And the web link that I've uh, got there down in the bottom, the uh, Alexa site uh, and top sites, if you go to that you'll see the top sites, it lists the top 50 sites and a lot of this social networking environment is well and truly up there. I mean, Google is, a, is sitting at number one and has for a, a prolonged period of time. But then straight under that, you've got Facebook and then you've got YouTube and then further down, you've got Twitter. These environments um, are basically being populated uh, and then populated by a generation of students who are wanting to connect. So we need to be conscious of the fact that the web tools are out there and it's a process of how we can engage them in learning in that environment. When we get closer to home though and we start looking at the um, Australian curriculum, this is where I see that the, the two capabilities, general capabilities that link in very well with inquiry based learning but also link in with the work that is, is happening within classrooms and the expectation that every teacher will need to be addressing this and how we can bring the web tools in. The very first one there is the ICT capability. In the middle you've got really core terms there which would be familiar with many 
uh, communicating, investigating, creating. Uh, that's really the whole a part of, of the inquiry process. And then around the outside we've got the um, learning opportunity or the teaching moments of being able to get students aware of their uh, digital footprint, their ethical practices, how to be socially responsible online and using web tools is a pathway to help them to do that because it's teaching as they're using those particular tools. And then the bottom one is, is managing and operating, which is a workplace health and safety aspect that can be looked at there. Then the second capability is the critical and creative thinking. And I would encourage you, if you haven't really looked at investigating these, you really need to start getting in there and reading the descriptors and the terms and in particular looking at the learning continuums that are being developed or have been developed that progress students through the development of their capabilities in this area. And now the critical and creative thinking um, is, is really a magic place where inquiry will Will be, will, sh will be shaping up. Even though there is specifically that um, component there that is targeted and, and labelled as inquiry, when we look at the other elements of analysing, synthesising, evaluating, reflecting, uh, creating and being innovative, that's all part of the inquiry process as well. So this is um, a great pathway to look at connecting the tools to um, the processes involved in addressing these general capabilities. And I'm going to be introducing a framework and some of you will be familiar with these frameworks as well. When I took the text that is wrapped around those two previous general capabilities and put it into a Wordle, and you know in Wordle you drop text in and what happens is the words that are repeated often come up as, as bigger uh, font size. And so here we can see that there are specific words that deal with uh, inquiry but also deal with a crucial component and that is information. I mean inquiry based learning wouldn't happen unless there was an information base, information resources, information materials out there for students. So my thinking was in this context is to look at well what information frameworks or information skills processes, uh, information steps that could be utilised that would allow us to bring in those general capabilities but also marry up um, some Web2 tools. One that is used in Australia uh, quite strongly is the New South Wales Information Skills um, framework there. And then another one that I know is starting to get some traction, it's been the uh, information skills process of Carol Coulthard has been around for a long period of time, but recently this year uh, they brought out this particular design process which again the terms there resonate with the capabilities but also resonate of course with the action verbs and action terms that are associated with inquiry based learning. And with this particular process here it does support that whole inquiry rich environment where it starts off with the curiosity, finds out what kids know, gets them starting to explore in depth and then start to get their questions together and then go and start capturing their information and then sharing and reflecting on what they've learned. So let's uh, go into this by utilising these frameworks. So in the top left hand side there I've got the very first step of the guided inquiry design process, the very first step of the New South Wales uh, information framework. And what is actually happening at this particular point within an inquiry based learning environment is it's getting the kids into an inquiry state of mind. And so it sets the tone for how this will all start to shape up and take direction, gets them starting to work out, well, what is it that I already know about this particular topic that, that we're looking at? So just to give an example, in Cool Fowl's book, The Guided in Inquiry Design Process, in the very first section they show a sample, a unit, and it's basically they hold up this bottle of water and they ask the question, well, why do we put bottle, uh, water in bottles and buy it from the store? And particularly if we think about this within a Western um, culture and a, and a developed society, you know, why do we do that? Why do we um, take water and put it in a bottle and then we go and pay for it when we could just turn on the tap and be pretty sure that 
that we would be safe with the water that we would drink. So in, they use this as an example to get kids to start to connect with um, the content that they're wanting to uh, explore and develop through the curriculum, but also get the kids to start thinking about certain questions. So what I wanted to do here was start off with the first um, set of web tools that uh, could be used. Now right at the top of the screen there, uh, is the web page where I have a whole list of tools. So here's the page that I have put together that has a whole host of web tools that uh, will support inquiry-based learning. I've given the links there to the New South Wales uh, framework but also to uh, the link to the, the text that you can purchase that has the guided inquiry process. So here in this very first stage, if I just scroll down, I've got the open, um, immerse and then defining. And in this, we're looking at tools like brainstorming tools, concept mapping tools, even using polls with students, so getting them to uh, receive a question and they do an answer and then they get feedback on that, uh, sticky notes, uh, using environments like YouTube and the TED-Ed to provide them with some stimulus material that gives them some introduction to some of the curiosity factors. Mainly it's just really using different um, brainstorming uh, type tools. So if I go back and the very first tool that I want to show you is a brainstorming tool. Um, so let me see if I can get, here we go, and we'll go into this. And the one I'm going to use is uh, picking up from that concept of the water bottle. And so I started to put together some things here. So water in our lives is the theme. And then there are various questions. Um, you know, where does water come from? Where do we get it? Now with this particular tool, if you've got uh, an interactive whiteboard or you've got a way of projecting the brainstorming tool in front of the students, it means it can be a collaborative uh, process of working together. And so when you're brainstorming, the way this works, like if we say, well, where do you get your water? Well, if we, we could say, well, you know, let's move this, this tap because we actually get water from the tap. We can bring it over here and it will move around. So we can um, add, add extra levels by clicking on the little icons here or we can move things around. And so you use this then as a way to kind of build up a whole lot of prior knowledge and capturing the thinking of the students in the initial phase. And then this brainstorming tool could be used through a number of stages through inquiry to help the students to progress through their thinking but then also when they want to start sorting things out or deleting things or determining specifically their questions. So it's, it's a good tool to use um, in that regard to capture the students thinking. Then the next tool is Wall Wisher. Now what I might do is uh, see if we can get in your question box over there, uh, if someone has used Wall Wisher, if you can just um, you know, key in something there about possibly how you've used Wall Wisher with your students. Really what it is, it's like you know, posting sticky notes and so in this case here I've created a knowledge creation wall and I've got people basically posting up there to say uh, how they engage students either through web tools or, or through any real-time processes that they might use within their classroom or within their school library. So has anyone used that? If you just want to um, pop something into the question section there to indicate how you, how you may have used that. Uh, while we're thinking about that, I'll just go out to this, uh, this particular space so you can see uh, what it actually looks like. So once I'm in here, you'll see that as I move my mouse over, I can actually click and edit or I can delete it if it's maybe an inappropriate because the wall wisher is pretty well a, a, an open environment. But if you're using this with your students, you can set this up where you moderate what goes on as well. But if you're trying to get some immediate a reaction where people are posting. I mean, even right now, if you picked up that URL of wallwisher.com forward slash wall forward slash knowledge creation, if you went to that now, while we're here online, you could be adding and sticking little sticky posts up there. And then once we do that, we can say, well, if we're wanting to do this, we're capturing it all. And then we can say, well, let's try and sort out our, our thinking here. So what we might do is brainstorming, of course, is, is one of the uh, first steps that we might use, so brainstorming's there. 
then we might use, uh, let's have a look, well interactive posters would be further down because it's a result of our, our capturing of our information. Using show and explain, that could be something that's in the early stages. Using movies would be something in creation. Uh, interact interactive concepts here like Instagrock is a search tool that would be earlier in the phase so it's easy enough to move things around and and to get some idea of uh, how things might be clustered together but in the initial stage is used as a way to just brainstorm just entering information getting their posts up there and then being able to see uh, and display this as a, as a collective environment so that's wall wisher um, now we'll go on to the next step, which is the explore and location. Now be mindful that this stage, the students are only kind of dipping in, getting a feel for what the content's about, they're looking around, they're not actually going into any depth of detail here because we haven't yet got them to a point where they're going to be um, setting their particular questions. This is just immersing them into the whole environment and letting them kind of feel their way around, explore ideas, start to think about what is relevant, what's not, um, and also then making sense of what they're, what they're reading, seeing whether they're able to get a different view or different perspective. Uh, there's all different ways of, of getting them to explore that particular environment. And this site here is more like a um, directory site, but it is a great little tool because it brings not only the search um, directories in that students would be using, but it also brings in book trailers, which could be uh, act as a stimulus. It brings in uh, authors and book reviews, and also some games. So it's quite a uh, quite a tricky little uh, directory, but really quite useful because it provides with those search directories a range of tools that would be available to different age groups of students. So this way then they're just finding their way around and, and checking the scene of what's happening. One of the tools that I really do love um, is Instagrock. I'm really quite delighted because it brings in such an interactive uh, visual display. And this is one uh, that I do want to show you because uh, there's quite a lot that you can do within this, not just in the way that you can capture um, the content and explore it and expand it, but uh, also too in the way that you can then capture the material. So if I'm going to use uh, a topic here, I'll just use endangered species. What it does, it goes out and and uh, uses that term and then and does a whole harvesting and gathering, and it comes back with various uh, key facts. First of all, it comes up with this uh, visual display that. It's indexed uh, certain terms. Now, with the little button right up the top here where the little professor is and the blackboard, I can take that down to a very elementary level with the students or I can take it up to um, more of a high secondary level with that as well. Now, if you want to, put, want to expand any of these, I'll, I'll just do a middle of the road here, I think. Okay, let's just look at this. So if we're looking here, uh, let's say we want to be looking at maybe the bald eagle. If we click on that, it goes and does a further expansion. So we can either continue expanding out and pursuing, and each time we do that, the uh, set of facts, websites, videos down the right-hand side changes. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll just go back to um, the endangered species uh, core element here. And what we do here with these key facts is there's a little pin. So if we find that there is a term here that we really want to have a look at, then what we can do is pin that fact. So let's just pin one of these. It comes in there. Uh, we might have another one that we want to pin there. So we put that in as well. Now the, the intriguing thing is if we go over here to our left-hand side and we click on the journal, what this does is it actually captures the term, the fact, and the URL. So it's a way of um, students, often when they go out and they're grabbing things here, there, and everywhere, they don't take the time to uh, identify the, the source, whereas this tool actually does capture that initial URL that they were looking at to be able to enter that into the process. Now if we were to go and look at, click on websites, it would come up with websites. And again, we can um, basically 
uh, capture these websites across and if I go to the journal, uh, the website is recorded there as well. What you can do with this then, you can email, if you look down further down the, towards the bottom of the screen, you can email that or you can print it. And so this is really quite handy and it's, Instagrok now has a, an education package which it didn't have when it was first launched. The other thing is they've also uh, managed to get it to work in uh, Internet Explorer but Internet Explorer version 9. So these web tools are constantly evolving all the time and most of them now are starting to get uh, education packages that they're connecting up with the program. So that's something that if you're interested uh, you can go and explore in, uh, in more detail. Now we'll move on to where we're actually getting the students to do their um, specific uh, guided inquiry questions that they are wanting to, um, wanting to pursue. And here, this is where they need to kind of just, um, what it says here is pause and ponder. So now we're starting to get them to think a little bit deeper about the content that they're wanting to um, use, look at what specific direction they want to take, um, you know, where do I need to go to find the information that I need? And I put in the previous thing I've kind of harvested from all over the place, developing further my understanding, my knowledge. If I went back to my uh, Instagrok, it might mean that no, I don't really want to pursue that topic so I can unpin it and it goes off uh, or I can even delete it out of that right hand side. And I can continue to work in an environment like Instagrok to get, get to a point where I can say, well, I'm, I'm looking at certain keywords here that I want to want to use and I can then start to look at how I will construct my question. Now I've just uh, I just noticed there's some questions have come into the question box so I'll just pause here for a little moment uh, and have a look at these. Uh, yeah I think I've answered the question about um, Instagram not working in Internet Explorer. It will work in Internet Explorer um, version 9 so it may mean that uh, you may have to upgrade your browser to be able to uh, pursue that. Okay, now the thing that I have found is that one thing I haven't found is I haven't actually found a, a really good web tool that will help students to construct their questions. So at the end, uh, in fact I might just go to that now if I can, uh, go back to here, if I go down a little bit further, so explore, might just review some of these as well. Uh, DuckDuckGo, Gogulians, Infotopia, Kidtopia, these are all great search engines that are, are useful for students as well. Uh, Photo Bucket if they want to be looking at uh, images that will help them to start to form their understanding. Uh, search Cube looks at developing a, a visual cube that has a range of things and it kind of spins around and, and takes its shape. I found that to be very slow and also in some browsers it seems to reach a point where it just doesn't, uh, doesn't progress any further. So it's one that you might have to just do experiment with. Uh, uh, simple Wikipedia, the Slime Kids one I referred to before and uh, Wiki Summarizer. But if I go down here to the Identify and um, Define, I haven't actually found a web tool, but um, one person that I was sharing with uh, over the weekend um, in uh, a professional learning that I presented on this same topic uh, suggested this particular site of the Ohio Department of Education and what it is, it uh, has different segments that students can progress through to look at how they develop their knowledge, how they uh, form their questions and what it does, it actually has kind of templates so it's not actually interactive web tools but it is a, a really good useful environment for, for folk to go to uh, to get some starters and get some templates of how they could use that. So going back to here, if we're looking at questions, these are really crucial because this is the pathway then through into that inquiry process for the students and, and to start to looking at developing the components of the creative critical thinking and starting to look at investigating using ICT. And there are different uh, types of questions. Uh, five W's and how is quite common. Uh, it's, they've been around for a long period of time and the mix of them and how you mix them up and how you build in the keywords and phrases is, is fairly crucial. And then there's the kind of fat and skinny questions where the way that you, or even open close is another term, how you use those questions again to, uh, to get the kids to form that 
to look at how they progress through into their topic so that they actually start to get down to some really serious why questions uh, to get to the solution creation and the higher level thinking processes. Then there are questions like this. There are procedural questions, if that's appropriate, to the particular subject, if it might be science or maths. There's reflective questions if they're looking at you know, some history. Uh, there are evaluative questions as well. So there's different types of questions and it's worth exploring these. And this particular wiki space was one that I found. And I'll just reiterate again that at the end of the, the webinar, I will provide you with the link where the PowerPoint will be. So uh, if things are, might be moving a little bit fast tonight, don't be concerned. You'll be able to uh, look at, go back and look at this PowerPoint by going to the web link that I will give you at the end. But this site here goes through a whole process of, of framing questions, of using rubrics, uh, so it's, it's a good tool as well, but not necessarily a web tool. It's more of an information tool uh, to assist people in that, developing how they might be working with questions with their kids. So then the next section is then they go, they're going out and they're actually um, getting the most important information that they need. They're selecting it, they're capturing it, they're recording their sources, they're uh, also looking at how their structure will be in how they might present their information with what they've got. They're looking at combining information and, and here they're actually getting into that higher order thinking in that critical creative thinking mode where they're looking at the analysis and th synthesis of the information that they're um, starting to, to capture in that process. Now again, the graphic organisers, concept maps, my, uh, mind maps that I mentioned in the early stage where we're actually creating that curiosity factor, uh, that can be a way of using that tool again to start looking at building that up or discarding things that may not be relevant, but they've got this one space where they're able to capture that. Uh, Spider Scribe is one site that can be used uh, in as a tool for, for, for brainstorming and then there are others as well. One element, and I'll just, uh, I'll just talk about this because this gathering and organising information is not only for the students and how they will be doing it, it's also how you as the teacher, as the educator or the teacher librarian can do it as well. You will be using web tools to gather information together or gather appropriate sites together depending on the age of the students so that they have um, a safe um, space, they've got an, an assurance that they will find information. Those sorts of tools are really handy and in this case here, this teacher has used the curation tool, Scoop It. And so they've gone and gathered uh, different websites, different uh, information material and brought that in and created their scoop called Great um, for Endangered Species. And so if we have a quick look at this, it's an environment that conti could continue to, to go and because they've specifically said it's Grade 4, you would be able to be confident in knowing that these tools that they have listed here um, are going to be appropriate for that particular year level. So what you've got here is someone who's already done something and uh, has started the curation process. So simply by going up in, you see in the top here, search, if, uh, if you um, are involved with Scoop It, uh, it's, it's a free environment to, to set up to get the initial uh, basis there. You can go in and search for different topics and start to look at gathering and harvesting those and if you've got other tools that you use, you could even just um, you know, bring the web link across so that it can be seen um, in another environment. And I might just um, go out to the site again and have a look at the gather, selecting and organising of the web tools that I've listed there. Uh, so here I've got not just tools that the students could use, but more so that teachers could use. The first one is a, a Flickr search tool that searches for images. So we need to be looking at this multimedia mix um, environment where you, we've got a bit of visual, a bit of auditory, um, some hands-on where they do quizzes 
or do polls, all those sorts of things. Then we've got um, Digo, who's that's the social, the bookmarking of the site, so you can capture things in there and have that available for the students. Now, you know, I'm mindful of the fact that in some environments people say, well, you know, they get there and they can start to go off and they could go to places that um, aren't appropriate. Well, if you go back and look at that ICT uh, capability, on the outside there, they've, you've got these moments where there is going to be an expectation in the Australian curriculum that you will be having moments when you will need to be teaching kids about social responsibility, appropriate behaviour, ethical practice, you know, their digital citizenship capabilities, all of that is going to be there as well. Uh, then we've got other tools here. So when I was saying before that you might go and pick up a URL, you might use something like NetVibes, uh, where you've got your publishing platform, where you've got everything there that you want the students to be directed to, to share, and to a certain extent you have some control over where you're directing them and where you're taking them to. Uh, there's a range here, so if you look at QR codes, uh, you may have developed, say, um, well even with this as an example, I could develop a QR code that incorporates the URL of this page and have it displayed on other locations where if people were to scan that QR code, it would take them to here. And that's the idea, is that you would have, uh, let's say you do uh, prepare like a, a paper pathfinder and you would drop a QR code onto that but on that web, web page where you would have added information to assist them so they might get something in paper but to continue to add to that they scan the QR code and they can be able to find further information on that. Uh, going down a bit further here, uh, Scoop It we've talked about, Site Hoover is a place where you can store all your favourite websites and all of these as I've said are free and for majority of them they do have an education, reasonably good value for money, most of them are of course American so we're dealing in American dollars here. Stick, uh, sticky is a sticky note, um, Survey Monkey. If, if students are doing things like um, surveys or they're doing polls, and then of course Wall Wisher again is another tool that can be used. So going on a little bit further here, we now move into the um, create, share and present stage. This is where the students now um, going through that inquiry process are now wanting to tell their story. So they're considering the audience, the most appropriate presentation format that they would need for that audience, getting involved in the creative process where they're bringing together uh, all of their information, all of their gathering of material that they've, they've got on the particular, that is addressing the particular inquiry question and then they're telling their story and sharing their learning with others and ultimately they're producing their inquiry product, whatever it might be. And again, there is so much out there that we can get away from um, you know, the PowerPoint presentation, even though the PowerPoint presentation does have a specific, specific role. Uh, it's easy, it's a generic tool and also now with some of the later versions of PowerPoint, there are a lot more features that you can build in and it can be quite dynamic environment if you're embedding sound, you're dropping video in there, you're getting um, the uh, customised animation going. It, it can be quite exciting and, and it's the creativity process for the students. One particular web tool is Glogster which is uh, interactive posters and if you see there, there's the EDU in front of Glogster and this is where you need to go to go to the education Glogster environment and in there you will find a lot of interactive posters that you could, you could if you wanted to already use, you could go and use those and you could even use those as a stimulus in the early stages of inquiry process to get kids to start thinking about a particular topic. So in this case here, you know, we've got one, two, three, four, all of those. Each of those is an interactive component of that particular poster. So that's a, a great tool that can be used. Also Wordle, uh, early in the piece I had this particular Wordle image and that was just taking text uh, which can be a little bit more exciting and dynamic to look at rather than reading copious information. So there's things that can be done there in, in capturing and using Wordle as a presentation tool and then being able to then speak to it 
if that's at the presentation mode that the student is actually choosing. One of the tools that I like, and, and it's uh, inf information graphics, I think are really great because they can say so much in just a short space of time. And you can take something dry, like the statistics that you see there in the bottom of the screen, which are basically statistics taken from the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics site about households uh, with internet access and without internet access. The image that's on the right hand side there is a little bit more exciting I think, a little bit more dynamic than just producing statistics. And I will have a look at this because I, I initially um, stepped away from inf information graphics because I was a bit concerned that they would take just too much time to do until I basically bit the bullet and decided that I would check out uh, an infographic uh, tool to see how it would go. And we'll just uh, get in here. All right, so I go to my library and this particular image. What this does is it has, it's a template and you can actually um, choose the template that you uh, want. Uh, over on the side here, there's little icons like the add a chart, add a map, add text, add a picture, add a video. All of these things can be brought into an infographic. So in this case here, I've just added some text, put some information there, and then for creating the chart, if I just double click on this, it will bring up the statistics that I captured from the Australian Bureau of Statistics site. So we've got the states and territories of Australia, the uh, household numbers with, the household numbers without, and then basically um, that gets loaded into this environment and I chose um, a pictorial display. Now what I'm going to do is just capture these and we're going to just show you another display in a different format. So not um, a pictograph. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to choose, I can either choose bar or columns. Now let's choose columns. So I'll add a chart and it will refresh and if we go down here now, it already populates with some data that's already sitting behind the scenes. So if I double click on the chart, I can come over here and basically get rid of uh, what they have there. Let's make sure I press the right key here. Delete is what I'm after. Um, so one, two, three, nine, and put those stats in and then go done. And this will repopulate. And as you can see now, we've got a column graph that says the household's width. Now if I go publish, or maybe I'll just go preview, let's just go top here, preview. If I go preview, this is the, um, you know, the, the state has the highest width, uh, then it goes down and as you can see, it, it captures and, and tells me the information. Now if I click on without, it then repopulates and we have the households without. Uh, internet access. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of kinky and fun, but it's a really great way of, of possibly getting students to take something that's rather dry and bring it into uh, this environment. The one thing that I learnt in, in developing this was make sure you've got your statistics or your data first before you come in here. And then when you're in here, just take some time to kind of play with these particular tools, whether uh, you know, a pie, well a pie probably wouldn't work very well. Uh, you have to kind of work out what type of display would suit the information that you're trying to include here in this process. So let's go back again and then we're into the last part of the inquiry and even though be aware that this is not a linear process, it's not step through, step through, step through. All the time the students can be going back. So if they're using a particular web tool where they're trying to get all of their information and all their processes in place, they will be going back and, and rechecking to see if they really do have the right information for their question or whether they might have to rethink it, whether they've got the appropriate keyword. All of this can happen and the tools that we've got today allow the students to kind of work in that environment. This one here with evaluate and assessing, it's not just looking at the content of whether they have an understanding of the content, it's also looking at the thinking processes that are taking place here because it's really thinking that is going to be the crucial part for the students in 
this particular um, level of operation and then looking at the processes. So will this process work? Can I take this process and use it in another environment? Um, did it work well or do I need to review it? All of those things are happening here. Uh, evaluating their learning outcomes, looking at their increased knowledge and then determining their next actions. Now one collaborative tool that I've seen used across a whole range of age brackets is VoiceThread. And you, you might want to go and have a look at VoiceThread uh, because, and particularly look at its digital library. Uh, there's one in there where it's about a grade two level and they're collaboratively doing a, a peer assessment of a student's piece of work. So the student has developed a PowerPoint and they have uh, little plastic animals. So they've taken a, a, a image and then dropped it into the PowerPoint and they've called the presentation I Spy. What happens in this voice thread environment is as each slide goes through, the teacher is adding a comment. So the teacher can add a comment of text or voice or some little video capture. The students, the other peers in the class can also do the same. And again, these particular environments have um, educational components. In fact, VoiceThread, I think, now has a higher education um, platform as well because it's very much a collaborative environment that has more people involved and it's very much this collaborative model, this participatory um, culture and also a place for conversation in, in this uh, environment. Um, now, before we go to have a look at the um, specifically the curriculum, I'll go back to the web and go back to here and go down to the Create Share Presenting and here we've got a whole range of tools uh, that can be either text-based or they can be video or images or auditory. It all depends on, uh, for a start, what needs to be communicated, the audience that, that it's being geared to and also the particular uh, interest and sort of pull that the student has towards uh, their particular uh, preferred learning and also their preferred presentation style. But um, there's Animoto, uh, used a lot particularly for book trailers. You've got Audacity as um, it's a free audio tool and basically you just need, if you've got a headset and mic on tonight, that's pretty well all you need and you can, you can do your audio. Then you've got other some audio tools as well. Uh, Blabberize is taking a picture and making a talk which is uh, you know, just a fun activity, but basically uh, if the student was needing to present something, a set of instructions of how to do something, they could use Blabberize to, to make it quite different. Uh, blogging tools, other information graphic tools, Logster is the interactive, another information graphic, Zing is a screen capture. So there's a whole heap here that I've, I've found that can be useful not only for basically students using them, but also if you're using them. So if if I go back to my original uh, comment right for the start where there were trends and trends being there's online learning and more hybrid learning, uh, I mean using something like Vimo as a basis where you could upload um, something for the students to then go and look at. So this is for, for your use as well in how you can use uh, some of these tools to be able to share uh, information with students that will help them uh, in their learning processes. So there's a whole lot there um, that can be used and now again I'm saying to you that m the majority of them are free and when you get them for free you only get so many features but they're at least they're enough for you to explore uh, before you actually start to say well yes I could use this and I could use this with a class or I could use this with a group of students or I could use this across a number of different year levels. With a summer break coming up, you know, it's a great chance to, to do a bit of um, f play and a bit of discovery and a bit of um, exploration. So for the evaluating and assessing, the voice thread, we've got Edmodo and this seems to be the platform particularly for schools who are going down the bring your own technology path. Uh, a number of them are, are using Edmodo as that classroom and specifically secure in social networking environments for their students. So going back um, to the presentation, I think it's also important as we go through this process to look at what's out there in the curriculum. So I just need to go to the curriculum and I've just chosen uh, history. What we have here at each level, so we've got 
foundation or K, but foundation is the term that's being used across Australia here, right through to 10. At each particular level, there is these inquiry questions and they're the initial pathway. Now, some of these aren't exactly you know, deep, meaningful questions for inquiry, but they are a platform on which you can build this whole inquiry-based learning and wrapping around that the, the tools that, that students can use. You know, and history is a great place. So as soon as we mention stories, we can think about any auditory, um, the storytelling component, or it could be stories in graphic visual displays. There's all different ways that the web tools can be used, not only to assist the students to get that initial exposure to the content and the information that they might want to pursue, but also as a way that they could present their final work as well. Now each of these levels, if I just um, scroll down here, so if we go down year one, we've got a different set of questions here um, where it's looking at peasant, present and past family life, so a different set of inquiry questions. Under each of these, these get teased out a little bit more, and here we've got pose questions about the past using sources provided. Each of these has an expansion. So you, by clicking on that, that will just drop that down or it would open it up. And again, um, depending on where your particular subject expertise is, you might go into that particular environment first, whether it be history, English, science um, or maths, and look at how this all fits together and look at how an inquiry-based learning framework could assist you to help navigate the students um, not only through the content, but picking up those crucial skills that they may need uh, in this particular environment in which they're learning. Now I'm just going to um, go back to the presentation and go to a question uh, box here to see whether anyone has any questions before we start to kind of uh, wind up um, tonight's presentation. While you're thinking about the questions, I might just see if I can get something happening here. I'm going to put up a little poll because one of the major things that one of the major things that I hear um, often is that schools are blocking a lot of these web sites. So if you can, if you can see the uh, poll there, if you can click on that, and we'll get some general idea of of how this um, is all shaping up for us, and basically we have to kind of work out how we might be able to go around some of this. I mean, our students, um, interestingly enough, are actually getting very smart at doing this. And, you know, for, for us, it's, it's, a, it's a major concern. Now, I'm going to see if I can. I'm going to close the poll because it looks like everybody's voted. And then I'm going to see if I can share this so that um, you should be able to see there that we've got actually nobody here tonight is saying that the school is blocking. This the bigger percentage is 71% are saying sometimes, and you know 29% are saying no. So we we are progressing, I think, from where it was possibly a couple of years ago. But the major concern is that in some states I've noticed that there is stricter control than in others. But if we're really serious about getting our kids engaged in real life learning and authentic learning practices, we have to be aware that some of these tools are going to have to be available for the students. And hence my thinking about the flipped classroom or the flipped library concept is if we are constantly confronted with uh, situations where we're being blocked, then maybe preparing material and getting it out there and letting the students know they can go to that um, outside of school. Now, of course, there is that um, equity of access situation, but we also have to be mindful that there are ways that we could um, basically uh, allow students to get access to that particular particular site. We could actually just be using our own devices and, and displaying that to the students as well. But it's something I think that you know we're going to have to grapple with, particularly as we see the bring your own technology, particularly as we see uh, the flipped classroom concept. All those things um, are going to be uh, part and parcel of how we continue to progress through to really make uh, learning authentic and make it also dynamic 
um, and engaging as well. So we're getting uh, pretty well to the top of our hour uh, for the webinar. Uh, at this point, um, I'll just do uh, share with you again, this is the website um, where you can go to get access to those web tools that I've got there. Right at the top of the site, I actually have a little survey uh, where I'm saying if you have a web tool that you use um, and that you're willing to, to share that, then just fill out the survey and then what can happen is I will make that and add that to that particular list so that it's a constantly evolving and growing list of how it can be used. Also too, within 24 hours, that is the web link where this PowerPoint presentation will be available so you can get access to the PowerPoint. And then um, with EduWebinar, um, each month we do hold particular events. Uh, some of them are paid events like this one, um, others are, are free events. I'm starting to be planning for the 2013 year, um, so that's going to be bringing in some other additional uh, free environments as well as the continuation of the paid webinars as well. So folks, um, I'm hoping that tonight you have been able to get um, some good ideas that you can use and in particular that you might have uh, identified some tools that you've never seen before and use the opportunity of the coming summer break to do some exploration for that as well. So thank you for joining me uh, for this evening and I hope that you have been able to get some good ideas and I look forward to seeing you again um, on another webinar in the future. So good evening, folks, and have a pleasant remainder of the, uh, the year as our school year closes down in Australia, and uh, best wishes.